document that would address these circumstances. And I said, no, but there actually there is one. It's called the Ten Commandments. This is not about some theory of society and all. It's rather, A, the fifth commandment is being broken. First of all, by the police that killed this man, Mr. George Floyd, by the policemen who stood by, they are culpable. I don't know about all the legal fine points, but to let somebody else die, and you could do something, and you do not even try. This is a problem of a sin against the fifth commandment and the protection of life. But we also see other people who had nothing at all to do with that or any crime at all being attacked. A woman in a wheelchair, a number of police are being shot. One is in very intensive care and life support because he was shot in the head in another state. Nothing to do with this. And this is also a series of sins against the fifth commandment. We also see that there are sins against the eighth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness isn't only about lying in court. It is also about making sure that proper judicial procedure is done. That is a responsibility before God by civil authorities, by witnesses, and by people participating in various ways in the judicial system. The lawyers and everyone else has a moral responsibility before God to make sure that proper judicial procedure is followed so that those who are guilty are brought to justice, but at the same time, their rights are protected until they are either convicted or vindicated. But this is another area where there is obvious anger at the way that judicial procedure is not always justly enacted, especially against those who are poor and people of color. We also see this destruction of private property, which is a sin against the seventh commandment. Taking or destroying other people's property who have nothing to do with this alleged crime it has no justification. And this is also a serious sin. All of us have to pull back a bit and not excuse any sin against any of God's commandments. All of us also have to do everything that is possible for us to show our own obedience to those commandments and seek not merely obedience, but seek out positive justice. I am struck by how or everybody I have met, regardless of racial or economic background, is absolutely appalled by what happened to Mr. George Floyd. But his family is expressing you know, shock and dismay by what is happening on the streets, sometimes in the name of the death of their brother. But as they themselves have said, doing these crimes 
does not bring him back. And I would add that committing other crimes of attacking people and destroying property does not help promote the justice that is needed to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. This is very serious. And it's a serious obligation for all of us, not merely to bring back quiet and peace, but also to be vigilant that we will also do everything possible to help promote what is just and right. I certainly remember growing up in the segregated South. I was on the easy side of the segregation where the white people lived. But I also could see as a very small boy that this doesn't make sense. And it never was morally good. It never made sense to separate people by race and to make it more difficult for people of one racial group or an ethnic group or religious group to suffer consequences because of their background that they have no control. God chose people to be the race that they're in, and he loves all the different races and cherishes each one. He loves the cultures that are produced by different communities. And he cherishes the search for truth that shows up in the differences of religion. And we have to be a people who do everything possible so that what is right is done for all citizens. If we neglect that, there'll be the day coming when perhaps our group is on the outs, our group suffers, and on what basis could we say that we should be protected when we did not stand for the protection of others? This, at the very basis, uh, most simple form of moral thinking is what we ought to do. But in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we are called to do even more if we can to help bring about a peace and be the people of the Beatitudes who hunger and thirst for justice, people who are peacemakers, and people who are willing, when necessary, to suffer for the sake of justice. This is very much our call, and we have to be very careful that we do that. We are getting back to our study here, which is on the Eucharist. And last week, I, my eyes had skipped down to the next chapter. We're on chapter 3 of my book about the Bible study on the Eucharist. And it'll be called the Behold the Lamb of God, studying the, who the Lamb of God is and what that means. Now, of course, we always want you to participate in this show. And through the, through the various means that we can, you can call into the show. Uh, which is on Tuesday between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you can, if you live in North America, you can call 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-9460. So one 205-271-2980. Another way to do so is to send us your questions or comments via email, our social media pages, and you can post your comments there. Um, that information is on the screen for you. And again, we're using the book I wrote uh, called The Eucharist, A Bible Study Guide for Catholics. You can get that at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC 
www.thinkingdeep.com. It is item T1375. And as I mentioned, we are going to be discussing the proclamation of Jesus as the Lamb of God. This is something that we proclaim in Scripture and in the liturgy. And if you're using our book, we are starting on page 45. All right. So, at Mass, one of the things that we see is that Jesus is proclaimed as the Lamb of God. We hear it said, Lamb of Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. This is what we pray when we re, uh, sing or recite the Gloria. And within that hymn of praise, we address Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Son of the Father, who take away the sins of the world. And we ask him for mercy. That's the earliest prayer to the Lamb. We also see at every Mass, whether it's a Sunday where we have the Gloria or not, at every Mass, that the priest breaks the host. And after he breaks the host, and after he breaks off a fragment of the host, and he places that fragment into the chalice. And as the priest does that, the, the people sing, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. And this is every Mass that we have some form of that proclamation. And that prayer, it's also a petition asking again, as we do in the Gloria, for mercy, but also asking for peace, something we very much need. And then, at the, very soon after that, the priest makes us a short preparatory prayer for himself to prepare himself to receive Holy Communion. And then he leads a prayer for the whole congregation. He holds up the host with the two hands, or you can hold up the host and the chalice. Either one is fine in the ritual. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. This brings together lines from two different books of the Gospel, of the, of the New Testament that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and that the Supper of the Lamb is a description of the heavenly wedding feast that, this, that we have. And after the priest makes that proclamation to the congregation, at that point, the congregation says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. That is a quotation from the Gospel of Luke where the centurion at Capernaum says to Christ, I'm not worried that you should enter under my roof. Jesus was going to go to his house to heal a sick servant. And, and he says, I'm not worthy of that. Only say the word, and my servant will be healed. But now we adapt it to as Jesus is preparing to come to us, we recognize our own unworthiness. We're sinners. We are not worthy of Christ coming to us. But we say that in order to um, be able to recognize in the uh, truth of the matter of our sinfulness and also an act of faith that Jesus can just say the word of forgiveness and heal us. This is something that we very much believe. Now here's the question. Why do we address Jesus as the Lamb of God? Why is this so frequent in the liturgy, in the Gloria, 
in the Lamb of God, the, the Agnus Dei, and in the proclamation right before we receive Holy Communion. Three times we do that. And how does this term, Lamb of God, help us understand the meaning of the Mass? That's going to be the question we address throughout this chapter. That's our, that's our goal. Now, let's take a look at the roots in the New Testament. First of all, we see that in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, that St. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. Now, keep in mind, this is an event that occurs after John had already baptized Jesus. So he, he, he'll mention that in there, that I, I saw the Holy Spirit come down upon him. And so he's already baptized Jesus. And from the context, we can conclude safely that this is also something that St. John the Baptist says, when Jesus is coming up to Galilee after the temptations in the wilderness, that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, he was fasting, and then the devil tempted him three times. Now he's going back up to Galilee. And this is where St. John confronts him and says to him, well, actually, St. John points out to everybody and says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the first explicit proclamation of Jesus as the Lamb of God. St. John the Baptist points him out right after the, having gone through the temptations. He continues in verse 30, and he says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. So this is someone that St. John had predicted would come, and now he points him out. And after he goes on to explain to the crowd that he saw the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus. The next day, Jesus walks by again. And as he watches Jesus walk by, St. John the Baptist exclaimed again, Look, here is the Lamb of God. A second time. He points him out. And at that point, it becomes a signal because it goes on to say that the two disciples heard John the Baptist say this and they followed Jesus. So this is uh, wh what they do, that the, he, two of John's disciples you know, come and, and see him and they leave John in order to follow Jesus. And when Jesus turned and he saw them, he said to them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. So this is when to the disciples, uh, one of whom was Andrew, because he'll later on go and call his brother Peter, and the other is John, the, the apostle, and they leave John the Baptist and start to follow Jesus. Um, and this proclamation is very much a key proclamation about the start of the gospel and the start of the spread of the kingdom of God. Now, St. John the Baptist is the first to address Jesus as the Lamb of God, but even there, 
he's not making it up out of nothing. He is, as we've seen in so much of our understanding of Christ and of the Eucharist, he is drawing upon the Old Testament. He is very much look, looking to this image of the Lamb in the Old Testament, and there are lots of ways in which this is uh, applicable. So let's take a look at some of them. Let's start off with the earliest, because we are going to see that the idea of the Lamb is strongly connected in the Old Testament with sacrifice throughout. The earliest example concerns Abel, the son of Adam and Eve. And it says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, that Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock their fat portions, so these are the lambs. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. So this is the first thing that we see, the first sacrifice. And this was pleasing, while his brother Cain's sacrifice was not pleasing. But the lamb that is offered is uh, the firstborn of the flock, and this is a sacrifice that pleases God. Secondly, in, also in Genesis, we see the next offering of a lamb in Genesis 22, verse 2. Now, Noah may have offered a lamb. We assume he probably did, but it's not mentioned. But in Genesis 22, the Lord God calls Abraham and says, Abraham, and it says, here I am, Lord. And then in verse 2, it says, it's just Genesis 22, verse 2. God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. And later on in the book of Chronicles, that mountain is the Temple Mount. We see that it's identified there. Now, this is a very difficult passage. But we have to keep in mind that in Canaanite religion, it was not considered unusual to sacrifice a child. And remember that Abraham had grown up a pagan. He would have seen this well. The gods oftentimes request human sacrifice of our children. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. He doesn't know what God had not said, namely, that this was to test to see if Abraham would obey him and trust him entirely. So this is what he does. And he goes to the land of Moriah, and it says in chapter, Genesis 22, verse 6, Abraham took the wood, of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. So Isaac has to carry the wood for the sacrifice. And of course, this has been seen as a preparation for understanding how Jesus would carry the wood of the cross on his back. And you, if you go to Jerusalem and go to Mount Calvary, you'll see there that there's a mosaic right as you come off the stairway and there's a mosaic on your right-hand side of the sacrifice of Isaac, that Abraham is there with a knife in his hand and the angel of God is holding back his hand while Isaac is bound on the wood. And then next to that is a mosaic of Jesus being nailed to the cross. So they make that parallel right there on Mount Calvary. So then at this point, we see in verse 7, Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, 
The fire and the wood are here, <coughs> but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, they would carry the fire, usually in a piece of broken pottery, and there'd be a little fire in there that you carry because matches and cigarette lighters had not yet been invented. So he had to carry a little bit of an ember to get the fire started. So we've got the fire, we've got the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abraham's answer is, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Now, on one hand, given the command that the angel had given him, Abraham would think that, well, God provided me my son. Now he's requesting it. He's requesting that back. So my son is the lamb. But that is a connection that we also see applied to Christ with this image. That's why Archbishop Sheen, Venerable Archbishop Sheen, used to say that that question, here are the fire, here are the wood, but where is the lamb? That question, where is the lamb, rings through the rest of the Old Testament. Where is the lamb? And so when they get to that, so we go on with the text. In Genesis 22, verse 9, when they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there by gathering stones, put them together, and laid the wood in order on top of the stone altar. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, this is a tremendous uh, point where he was willing to do this and to, to sacrifice his own son. God sees that he's going to be obedient and stops him because then you see clearly from that point onward that there's a break from the old customs of the Canaanites and that now human sacrifice is never ever to be done. It is completely rejected. The pagans kept doing it, but for Israel it is completely explicitly rejected. And then you see in verse 13 that at that point Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the word provide is the word to see. The Lord will see to it. And he did see to it. Um, but that was that ram. The question about who is this lamb of God that is the proper sacrifice, that continues to ring on even after this. And that's very, very important for us in the liturgy. All right, take a break now, and we'll come back and continue on with a little bit more explanation and your questions, so please stay with us. Hello, family. When Mother Angelica launched EWTN, Few people thought that a cloistered nun with no television experience could keep her network going for more than a few months. 
But here we are, almost 39 years later, fulfilling Mother's mission to bring the eternal word to the world. From our earliest days, Mother would ask viewers to make a gift to support EWTN each month. She referred to this as keeping us between your gas and electric bill. During the recent One Day Giving Tuesday event, we asked people to join us as monthly donors. And the response from our EWTN family was overwhelming. In one day, we added more than 700 new monthly givers, nearly three times our original goal. Help us continue this momentum. Please consider keeping us between your gas and electric bill. If you're already a monthly donor, thank you. Every donation is important, but monthly gifts provide a steady source of support all year long. This allows us to bring you ongoing programs like Live Adoration, The Daily Mass, events from the Vatican, and more. We receive no funding from the church or our media partners. This network is brought to you by you. Thank you for your prayers and for your support. May God bless you. Your monthly support of EWTN makes it possible for the world to know the eternal word. To set up a new monthly gift today, visit EWTN.com forward slash monthly donor or call us Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern at 1-800-447-EWTN. Next time on EWTN Live. What do the Gospels reveal about heaven? Father Sebastian Walshy explains how the parables can deepen our understanding of paradise on the next EWTN Live. up the two passages about lambs in, that are significant for us in uh, Genesis. Now, let's take a look at Exodus. The first mention of lambs in the book of Exodus is in chapter 12, where it says in verse 3, tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. And they, they describe the lamb it's, uh, that you're supposed to have for your families. A uh, lamb shall be without blemish, so no um, wounds or anything. A year old male. And that you shall take it from the sheep or from the, the goats. And that you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. Now, why would they choose it on the 10th, but wait until the 14th? The idea was to make sure that the lamb was still healthy. It might look good when you choose it, but you want to make sure that it stays healthy. And right you know, during the day, before the evening, they're to slaughter the animal, and then you clean it and all, and uh, they're supposed to roast it. And it says in verse 7, chapter 12, verse 7, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Now, this is uh, very interesting. Because, think about that, the, lint, the, the doorpost of the two pieces of wood over a doorway, the lintel is the beam across, okay? And, of course, lots of Christians have seen this as a preview to the wood of the cross. It's very important, you know, the way the, the wood that uh, Isaac carried up Mount Moriah is seen as a sign, a prefigurement of the cross. Now the lintels with the blood sprinkled on them are prefigurement of the cross that would be stained with the blood of Christ as he hung upon it. 
And then we go on to see that uh, they, they would roast it, of course, at that point. And in chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 8, they say, they shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. Now, you would, of course, take out the intestines and, and bladder, and so you don't eat that. But the other internal organs, you would roast with it. And the, the, the heart and the liver, and uh, you have to clean up the kidneys pretty carefully. Um, so that uh, this is uh, supposed to uh, we're supposed to do. Now, the idea of raw, you know, uh, eating raw meat is done in the Middle East. That's why they had to tell them, no, no, you have to cook it. Uh, it's, it's very, very common uh, when, they'll, when they're butchering a lamb that they'll eat the raw liver uh, or they'll take some of the, the meat and they'll mince it and uh, like steak tatar, you know, that, but they call it Kibinaya in Arabic. Um, so that's very common, but not for Passover. That's not allowed. They can do it other days, but not on Passover. It has to be all roasted and cooked. And then it even gives instructions how, what's the attitude of the people eating it. In verse 11, this is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, in your staff in hand, you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. In other words, you eat it like people who are getting ready for a journey. This meal will strengthen you for the journey from slavery to freedom. From slavery in Egypt to freedom uh, outside in, in the Sinai. And the reason I have to do that, he explains in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And this uh, is going to very much be the punishment. Remember, why this punishment? Because the Egyptians had been killing all the boy children of Israel. And after plague after plague, there were ten plagues. This is the tenth of the ten plagues. And they had all sorts of chances, but they would not let Israel go. So now the punishment fits their original crime of infanticide. They were killing these babies in eat, uh, of the Hebrews. Now they will lose their firstborn sons. And the Lord explains the symbolism by saying in chapter 12, verse 13, the blood, that is the blood of the lambs that are on the doorpost and lintels, shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this is going to be a symbol for them. And this is um, very much uh, a sign that you can, again, a prefigurement that if the blood of Christ cleanses us, if we believe and receive the blood of Christ and the Holy Eucharist, then the Lord will pass over our sins too. That's the parallelism here. And he goes on to explain in Exodus 12, verse 14, this day shall be a day of remembrance. Now we see that word remembrance again that we saw last week when we talked about do this in memory of me. Well, this shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And you shall observe the festival of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your companies out of the land of Egypt. And you shall observe this day throughout your generations 
as a perpetual ordinance, which is also what we do with the Eucharist. This is exactly what the Eucharist is, a perpetual ordinance, but it's daily because of our total commitment to Christ, not just once a year. And then you see in verse 24, Exodus 12, verse 24, you shall observe this right as a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. When you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you shall keep this observance. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, because you have to teach the next generation. You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed down in worship. And these are still the things that the people of Israel do when they celebrate Passover every spring. And it is very much uh, uh, important for us to do that we are uh, to be very committed to our ongoing celebration of the Supper of the Lamb, that is the Eucharist, and we are to continue to teach our children what Christ has done for us, not taking us out of slavery from Egypt, but taking out of, us out of slavery to sin and giving us the freedom of the children of God. This is something very important. All right. Now we've got some questions. We'll stop there and we'll pick up next week on the Christian understanding of this. But from YouTube, we have a question. Father Mitch, I've heard people using Christ's cleansing of the temple as justification for the destruction of property. How might we respond to this? First of all, did our Lord destroy anything? It says that he overturned the money changers' tables and he chased the money sellers out of the market area of the temple. But he didn't kill the animals. He didn't take the animals and said to other people, you take these animals. No, he didn't do that. He didn't pick up the coins and give them to the apostles, nor did he give the coins to the poor, did he? He just threw them over. People would have picked up their own stuff, but he prevented this going on in the temple. Why? According to the Mishnah, which is the traditions of the rabbis of the Pharisee party, as well as according to the Jewish historian Josephus, we see that the high priests were selling those animals at four times the actual value of them. They would tell people, oh, I'm sorry, your animal is blemished. You can't use that for a sacrifice. But I happen to have one over here that's not blemished. And for four times the price, you can have it or else you can't offer a sacrifice. It was a scam. And our Lord overthrew the scam. But he didn't take their stuff. He didn't destroy their animals or take their money or destroy their money. He just drove them out of that place for doing something that was wrong. And that's a very different situation. Okay. We have another question from YouTube. Father Mitch, was Christ ever tempted prior to his temptation in the desert or when the Holy Spirit led him out to be tempted? Was this the first time he was tempted in his life? Nothing is said anywhere. Um, we have no indication of him being tempted before this. He would not have had the temptations that come from within us. Most of us have temptations that come from inside. I usually don't need help from the devil to come up with temptations. I do pretty well coming up with temptations all on my own because of the disorder of original sin. 
But Christ our Lord did not have original sin, so he did not have internal temptations. So if there were any temptations that came to him, they were from outside. But we don't know anything about that. You know, did some of the boys that he grew up with try to tempt him to do something wrong? No idea. No idea. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, I can't really speculate on. Uh, so I'll just leave it as unstated and therefore not really necessary for me to know. All right. All right. We have a caller coming in. Mike, where are you calling from? Hi, Father Mitch. I'm calling from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Great. Great. Good to hear, hear from you. Okay, my question is this. I know Catholics do not believe in the theology of the rapture of the right. Church. Right. Um, but in light of the scriptures that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 mm -hmm. and in 1 Thessalonians, how do you relate those to what happened to Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament? To me, mm -hmm. that was like a foreshadowing of the rapture of the church. How, would, how do you see what happened? How do you uh, see Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament? Sure. You know, uh, obviously both of them are very special cases. And what we do not see is that they died and were resurrected. See, that's very distinctive, isn't it? That uh, neither one of them died and then rose again glorified. So somehow they are taken without that, you know, uh, uh, death and resurrection. And this, th that sets it differently from the ascension of Jesus. Jesus, our Lord, did die was resurrected and glorified in his body and then ascended into heaven. We see what happened to them as much more of a preparation for the assumption of Our Lady. That's a little bit closer to this, though she too was uh, glorified. When she was assumed into heaven, she was glorified and her body was transformed. So she is of a higher level than they would be. But in, neither in the ascension of Jesus, nor the assumption of Our Lady, nor the assumption of Enoch and Elijah, uh, do we see exactly what they mean by the rapture, where you are taken up and given your glorified body, but the rest of history continues on, and then Jesus will come back later on. That's a, a different situation that is that the people who uh, came up with this doctrine of the uh, rapture in the uh, middle of the 1800s, that was the first time that it ever appeared. Um, the word rapture is not in the Bible, of course, and it's, um, the doctrine was invented in the middle of the 1800s. And they mean, as a matter of fact, they cannot even agree on what they mean by it. Some of them think that you'll have a rapture before the great tribulation. Those are preacher people. Some say, no, the tribulation is going to come, but during the tribulation they'll be taken out and glorified. And others say it'll be after the tribulation. And they fight among themselves. Well, th there's no basis for deciding that because there's no basis for any of those questions in Scripture. Uh, and to go from the specific case of Enoch and Elijah to anything further about the rapture would be saying much more than the text allows. Okay? All right. Let's now go over to um, um, the... Uh, Eucharist, uh, or some of the questions that we have here. I have a question from uh, Debbie. Uh, and it says, Father Mitch, I look at the Eucharist in adoration. I don't see or feel that Jesus is there. 
I read books and try to sit and keep my eyes open or eyes shut? Is it a dynamic feeling or is it just a trust and faith that he is there? Am I being shielded from feeling anything? Is there anything wrong with me? Debbie, first of all, Debbie, I don't know you. And I am going to assume that there's nothing wrong with you, but I don't know. Uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm not a, a, able to determine that, but I doubt that there's anything wrong with you. Um, what I would focus on is not exactly what you feel. And here's why. The sentiments that people have is not the same as their act of faith. I learned this from Sister Ida way back in eighth grade that you don't depend on how you feel at a particular moment. We make this act of faith in our Lord and we very much focus on that act of faith. And, you know, to have a sense of paying attention. So if we're reading a book, to do so with attention to his presence, asking the Lord, Lord, speak to my heart. Don't worry about how you feel, but ask him, you know, which of these words that I'm reading in say, hopefully sacred scripture, I strongly urge people to read scripture and trust that our Lord, present in the blessed sacrament before you, is trying to speak to you. And he will normally use the words of Scripture. So keep in mind that the same Jesus who is speaking in the gospel is the one present to you and addressing your heart. Focus not on your feelings, but focus on, Lord, what do you want me to hear from you? Don't worry about what you even say to him, but learn to listen to the words, and especially as certain words seem to be highlighted, certain words seem to come alive. That would be what our Lord is asking of you. One other thing, too. Sometimes he gives us spiritual dryness in order to get us to grow spiritually. And that's, it's not a moral problem at all. It's just a matter of taking some steps, you know, that seem alone, but they're not. But there are also times when there's dryness because we need to repent of a sin. So pay attention and get a spiritual director to help you discern whether, is there something I need to repent of? Or is it just that nothing, it's not a matter of the sins I've done, our Lord is just asking a new stage of growth from me. And pay attention to that as well. Okay? All right, then we have uh, another email here. This is from uh, Tony. It says, Dear Father, in the Blessed Sacrament, who was actually present? Is it the crucified Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, or the glorified, resurrected Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, or both? But well, we have blood in our body when we are united with it. Well, I assume that we'll have blood. Um, but it won't get leukemia or sickle cell anemia or any other blood disease. Um, but in the Blessed Sacrament, it is the same Lord Jesus who, and this is what the fathers of the church teach from the first and second century that it's the same Jesus who was born of the Virgin Mary, who died on the cross and who rose from the dead. It's not distinct. And remember, this is where the eternity of Christ comes into play. That because Christ has true eternity, his incarnation in the womb of the Virgin Mary is not in the past. His crucifixion is not in the past, 
past. His birth is not in the past. His resurrection is not in the past. All of it is always and eternally present to him. He has no past moments. So his childhood is not in the past. It's present. And it is that one Jesus Christ present there. And his death, resurrection, birth, incarnation, all are present there. Okay? So that's very important to keep in mind. It's a great question. All right. We run flat out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lead you and guide you by his peace, especially in these troubled times. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And we'll keep bringing you programs, masses, and prayers. Thank you. Coming up, pray the chaplet of divine mercy. Next, here on EWTN. Just before the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church was strong and united. However, saints had always stepped forward to help and protect Holy Mother Church from heretics and worldly lax clergy alike. Before the question of indulgences arose, there arose the question of Luther's own tormented conscience. He says in one place that he wasn't reading or studying, he was his own depressive conscience that led him to his theological conclusions. But I think it goes to the heart of what drove him in his obsessive need to tear down everything and rebuild the church in his own tormented image. It is important that Christians of the 21st century understand the Protestant Reformation because we cannot understand the modern world without understanding the Reformation.